Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming today. My name is Matt Zeiderman. I'm a second year medical student, and I'm the president and co founder of the Benjamin Rush Institute, which is a new student group here at U of L. Um, this is our first event, and we're privileged to have not just our senator, but also a medical doctor as our first guest. In addition, today we're also joined by Dr. Tony Gansel, Dean of the School of Medicine, and Dr. John Sock, Dean of the School of Dentistry. Many of you have probably not heard of the Benjamin Rush Institute. It's a national medical student group founded in collaboration with the Pacific Research Institute, which is a think tank located in San Francisco. In the last few years, BRI has grown to roughly 20 medical school chapters, including in institutions such as Yale, Duke, and Mayo. BRI, Benjamin Rush Institute, is based on the principle of preserving the doctor-patient relationship. The relationship between a doctor and a patient is very meaningful, and those of us who embrace the ideals of the Benjamin Rush Institute believe that patients and physicians have the right to begin, develop, and terminate this relationship mutually and free of bureaucratic influence. With the ever-increasing influence of government and legislative control of the healthcare system and rising healthcare costs, the ability of patients to choose their healthcare providers is becoming more limited and compromised. However, we don't learn about the changing landscape of healthcare and healthcare legislation in our classes. As a group, BRI's goal is to bring well-informed speakers to campus to educate medical students about alternative solutions to the healthcare issues of Kentucky and America. Physicians have excellent and arguably the best insight to analyze and correct the problems of the healthcare sector. Those who experience the problems ought to have the best solutions to them, right? However, the perspective and opinion of the physician healthcare provider is underrepresented in our federal government, especially in comparison to those who hold law degrees or professional politicians. 157 House representatives and 57 senators hold a law degree. There are currently only 20 physicians in Congress, three of whom are senators. Kentucky is fortunate to be represented by one of the most influential doctors elected to Congress, Senator Rand Paul. Senator Paul graduated from Duke University School of Medicine in 1993, and he completed his residency in ophthalmology at Duke University Medical Center in 1993. Excuse me. <laughs> he began practice in Bowling Green, Kentucky in 1993 until his election to the United States Senate in 2010, and he continues to provide pro bono medical services. We're privileged to have Senator Paul as our guest today, and those who could not be here, his message is being shared via a live stream. Senator Paul, thank you for coming today. It's an honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. This uh, brings back memories of me being in the auditorium. I was always in the back left. So those in the back left, that's, that's my spot back there. So uh, we used to do the wordy gurdy. It was a rhyming thing when we were when we were after we were done listening to the lecture, of course. But uh, it was five letters, two syllables, rhyming words. We were good at the jig, the crossword puzzle. You name it, we were pretty good in the back left hand corner. I come from a family of uh, a large family of physicians. My dad's an OB. Uh, my little sister's an OB in Houston. I have a little brother who's a family doctor in Fort Worth. And then I have two nieces who uh, just went to uh, one in medical school in Houston and one who's in uh, internal medicine in Texas as well. People always ask, well, would you want your kids to go in medicine? You hear such bad stories from, you know, people my age and a little older saying, oh, it's so terrible. I told my kids not to go into medicine. There are more struggles, and uh, the golden era of medicine, from a physician's point, may no, may no longer be there, but I would still choose to go into medicine. And I tell young people I would still choose it as a career because even with all the headaches, even with all the new paperwork, even with all the new government involvement, and I mean lots of paperwork. I mean, I signed 14 forms for doing cataract surgery. They think somehow 
we're going to be healthier if we sign more forms, or somehow healthcare is better and higher quality by pushing more paper around. It's ridiculous and absurd, but that's what your life will be, is more paper. But that doesn't make it a bad profession. I mean, it's a great profession. What other kind of profession? I, I talk to lawyer friends all the time, and they are jealous, and they ought to be. But they are jealous of physicians because we actually do something to help people. Nothing really. Lawyers probably do something. <laughs> but the thing is, we actually do something. You can see a result. You know, as an ophthalmologist, yesterday I did four cataract surgeries. Uh, these were all people without insurance. Uh, two of the people, one person could see hand motion in one eye and counting figures in the other eye. Essentially, not even enough vision for ambulation. Usually you have to see a little big E or a little bit worse than the big E to get around. This person was seeing hand motion and counting fingers. This is a white cataract, completely white, and uh, difficult technically sometimes to remove. But he could sit up and see after the surgery. It's an amazing thing. No matter which profession you're in, ophthalmology is obviously the best if you're still thinking about your career. Um, well, I mean, in some ways I really like it because you see immediate benefits. But in all of our professions, all of the things you do, you get to see something that you actually do uh, that uh, makes your patients better. You get to see that and get that response that's really priceless above and beyond everything. There is a danger that some of that's being lost to government overreach. I think people are well-intentioned. They want to cover more people. They want to have more insurance for people. I'm not sure that's going to actually happen. I'm worried actually the opposite may happen. But I think that even with all of those obstacles, it's still something I would choose to do all over again. I still remember uh, drawing blood for the first time. Anybody in here remember the first time they drew, they drew blood? Uh, we did it on uh, our, our friends in class. That's the way you do it? You do it on somebody else in the class? So my, my buddy had worked for his dad for many years and drawn blood. And even though my dad was a physician, I'd never drawn any blood till I drew it on my friend. And, of course, my hands were shaking as I did it. The reason I remember that and relate that to being in politics is the first time you give a speech uh, you know, in front of people, it's the same kind of thing. There's a certain fear and trepidation. Now, some people may say, oh, I never was squeamish about blood. I never had any trouble doing any of this. Most people, it's a little bit of overcoming. For me, it was I got better each time. You know, it's the same way with eye surgery. People say, how can you cut into the eye and how can you do this and that? The first time you do something, every one of you, if you think, oh, my goodness, I'm not sure I chose the right profession, it's the same for everybody. I think most people, there's a certain overcoming. It's the same with public speaking. It's also the same with doing surgery, the same first time you draw blood and things like that. It is an overcoming process. Because I think a lot of us sort of innately, somehow through nature, have an aversion to blood because when you see blood and, you know, you're running around hunting, it's not a good thing. Blood's not a good thing. But we do overcome those things, and as a politician, I'm still trying to overcome the stage fright of giving a speech, but I'm getting there. But uh, when we look at where we're going to go as a country, we look at what are the problems, what's it going to be like for young physicians as you come out, I think one thing's pretty much a given. There aren't many independent physicians anymore. I grew up, my dad had his own office. I liked having the idea of having my own office. I got out of training, and I was a little worried about setting up my own office, so I joined a group, was with a group for three years. Then I made a choice again, and I was with a bigger group for about 11 years, a big multi-specialty clinic. And then I finally bought my office, and I had my own practice, and I loved it. And it was just a little building across the street from the hospital. And then I ran for public office. My wife's like, why would you spend all that money on all that equipment, the office, get it all set up, and then run for office? Well, I never really had planned on winning. I was just going to run for office. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, you know, different things happened. I also planned on continuing to practice medicine as a senator, and that didn't work either. I got there, and they told me I couldn't do it at all. I could do it for free, but it's kind of hard to own a building, a practice, pay employees, pay for your malpractice without getting any, any payment. So I said, can I be a nonprofit group? Could I be a nonprofit, not take a salary, but pay for my malpractice, pay for the people who help to do the building, pay for the, the technicians that work with me? No. That was the answer I got from them. So I still help and do things. And fortunately, I've been lucky enough to meet some people around the state. Different ophthalmologists have helped me. So yesterday I was in Paducah at a surgery center. I've operated in Glasgow, Bowling Green, Corbin, and Lexington at different programs. I think it's one of the things that people think it's unusual. It is because I'm a senator in doing it. But it's not that unusual in the medical profession for people to help people who don't have insurance. It's been going on since the beginning of time. It's underreported. We always have. Even before there were any rules, people say, oh, well, that only started in 1971 when it said you couldn't turn people away from the emergency room. It's just frankly not true. 
Physicians have always, since the beginning of time, since the Hippocratic Oath, we've always had an obligation to take care of people, and we always have. It was originally sort of a rule, but it was based on hospital uh, privileges, and still kind of is, although there's now a law that says the hospital has to admit people. It always was that when you agreed to work at a hospital, one of the things you would do is you would take care of those who didn't have insurance. You would see them through the emergency room when you were on call, and you would take care of them. It has never been perfect. I don't think the new program is going to be perfect. But there was a lot of charity that was done under the old system. The biggest problem under the old system, though, was not uh, uninsurance. It really was cost. 85% of the public had health insurance. What I heard every day was it cost too damn much. From businessmen and women buying the insurance, from individuals buying the insurance, it cost too much. And we didn't fix that at all. We did nothing to that. In fact, we've done sort of the opposite. And you have to realize that most things come out of Washington, they have what I call the dinosaur syndrome. Big hearts and small brains. So they have great sympathy for people, and so do I. They want to help people. They want to give everybody insurance. Problem is, is by, and they want the insurance to cover everything. Problem is, if you want insurance to cover everything and everybody to have it, it's extraordinarily expensive. So if you tell a 22-year-old that you've got to have insurance and has to have pregnancy coverage, they're like, I'm not married. I don't want pregnancy coverage. I want a high deductible policy that doesn't cover much because I want to pay very low premiums. It doesn't exist. Or they make it illegal. I think under Obamacare, you're going to be able to get it until you're 30. What if at 35 you still don't want pregnancy coverage and you still want a higher deductible? I'll give you an example of how health care sort of was working in a system that wasn't working. I worked at a multi-specialty clinic with about 65 doctors. The insurance there, I think, was $12,000 for family coverage, and then the employee paid $2,000. Well, I was both employer and employee, so I was paying like $14,000 for insurance. But I didn't want to do that, and I'd come from the outside, so I said, I just want to keep my own insurance. So they let me. My insurance cost between three and $5,000 for 11 years. Theirs was costing twelve to $14,000. Why? I chose to have a $5,000 deductible. But over an 11-year period, I saved nearly $90,000 by buying cheaper insurance. Why wouldn't you want to have the choice to buy cheaper insurance? So when you look at the 15% of the public before we got into Obamacare that didn't have insurance, a third of them were young, healthy, and made $50,000 or more. Why are they not getting insurance? Because it costs too damn much. So you need to bring the price down. How do you bring the price down? you got to let people buy the kind of insurance they want. When you're young and healthy, you should want insurance that has as high deductible as you could possibly conceivably think about, because then your premiums will be tiny. I mean, literally, you want, instead of $1,000 a month, you want a $1,000 a year policy. Here's the other side benefit to this, and this is counterintuitive, because for 50 years, we drifted towards lower and lower uh, deductibles and having the insurance company pay, which meant the consumer didn't care about it. So when you go to the hospital and you have a heart attack... When you have a heart attack and it caught the bill's $100,000 and you look down there and your mouthwash costs 50 bucks, if your deductible's 10 or 20, you don't care. So no one ever calls the hospital and says, why the hell did you charge me $50 for my mouthwash? If the consumer doesn't care about the price, the price will rise more rapidly than other things. So everything else you buy, iPads, computers, iPods, all of that, prices go down because of competition but because you ask the price. So in medicine, the few items in medicine where the price has gone down are when you ask the price of something. So two things in ophthalmology generally are not covered by insurance. LASIK surgery to get rid of glasses and contact lenses. Price went down every year. When I started, it was over $2,000 an eye. Now many people are doing it for under $500 an eye. What's the unusual thing about LASIK versus anything else? Anybody ever call uh, you up and ask you how much a bronchoscopy is going to be or a colonoscopy? Nobody asks you because their insurance company's paying for it. You know the few people who will? Those who don't have insurance. So the irony is the few percentage of people in our public who don't have insurance actually control some of the prices. Mennonites, for religious reasons, they choose not to have insurance. When they want something done in my office, they call and ask the price. When I tell them the price, they say, well, I'll pay cash. Then they say, I'll pay up front. They, they negotiate you down with the price. That's how prices fall is when people ask about the price. Uh, immigrants, legal or illegal, I didn't ask. If people came in, it's my job if they want my services. But if they came in and asked me and they were going to pay cash, 
They would also ask, and pterygiums are very common for people from southern latitude to work in the sun. It's a benign growth, but sometimes it can kind of get onto the cornea and be a nuisance, and we'll remove them. It can be done in the hospital, but it's pretty simple. It can be done in the office. I prefer doing them in the hospital because it's easier, and they've got better equipment and stuff. But if somebody wants to save, I mean, my fee might be two or $300 to do it in the office, but the fee with the hospital might be 3000 because, you know, we, we don't have any price competitions. But people who do care about the prices pull prices down. So really, we went the opposite way. Obamacare decided to do it through mandate and by through subsidy to cover everybody. What I would have done is try to drive the prices down for everybody, including the 85% who do. So really what you want is against sort of the intuition of people. You want higher deductibles and you want uh, people to pay. You want people to pay. That's We've kind of gone backwards. We had insurance that went lower and lower in deductible, and then insurance companies figured this out too, and they came back in with co-pays and deductibles to try to bring consumer behavior in. But when the consumer pays, you will keep prices down. That's really what you want. You should expand health savings account. Health savings accounts were the best thing to happen to health care in the last 20 years. It used to be you could only have it for one year. You had to spend it by the end of the year. It was gone. Health savings accounts let you roll it over. And the limit was 5000 Obamacare is going to make it 2500 For example, I have three kids. They've all had braces. I put money in this account tax-free to save for their braces. You can't get braces for $2,500, you know. We really need not only $5,000 HSAs. We need unlimited HSAs. I'd give you no limit on how much money you want to save for your health care. Let's say you were 12. Think of how it could work. Under, and this is somewhat idealizing the problem. You're 22 years old. You, you uh, have to buy your own insurance. You get a $2,000 deductible and just say, look, if I get sick and I have to pay $2,000, I'll either borrow it, borrow it from my parents, make payments, whatever, but I'm going to take a risk on the first 2000 What are the chances you get sick at 22? One or two percent. Very small. But if you're conscientious, you want insurance for an auto accident or cancer or something dramatic. 99% chance you go through the first year and you don't get sick. What should you do? Get a $4,000 deductible and put $2,000 more into an account. Conceivably, a large body of the public that didn't get sick between age 20 and 40 would be putting money aside and having a $10,000 deductible or a $20,000 deductible. People say only rich people could do that. You, you can do it if you do it a little bit at a time and keep gradually working up. Then what would happen is there would be a marketplace. Everybody would be asking the price of things. For doctors, there would be no more fee setting. Doctors are always complaining about the SGR. It's a sustained growth rate. Medicare decided 15 years ago that they would reduce what they pay doctors every year based on inflation of health care prices. For some reason, they blame doctors for health care going up, and doctors were having to pay the whole penalty. If you had a system with higher deductibles, you'd have no price setting. So I've actually proposed some of this, that Medicare would be transformed into the federal employee health plan, It'd still be subsidized, be about the same out-of-pocket for every senior citizen, but the difference is there would be no more Medicare fee setting. There would just be 200, there'd be a panel of all these plans like we have for the federal employees. Then you'd get away from the sustained growth rate, which really isn't a growth rate for physicians. It's a sustained decline in physician payment. All of this being said, we need more choices, not less choices. I think that's the answer. More competition, not more government. More uh, freedom of price movement and more consumer involvement. If all of those were to occur, I think you could get to a better situation. Would everybody insure, be insured? Probably not. But if you got to where you're 90 or 95 percent, then we, we do it through traditional charity. Or if we do it through government, we do it through Medicaid. But we can't succumb to this thing that everybody should be on Medicaid. The other day, Harry Reid said, oh, he really thinks the end result we should have is a, a single-payer system. Think what that means. That means everybody on Medicaid. Your hospital, even a public hospital or a public university, cannot survive on what Medicaid pays. They survive because a certain percentage of people pay private insurance, and that helps to float the rest of the hospital. This is all hospitals all across America, all across Kentucky. You can't make it on all Medicaid. Plus, Medicaid is you. Everybody's having to pay. And what is Medicaid? It's unlimited health care with no repercussions to cost. So why do people on Medicaid use it more than people who have a $50 deductible? It's simple. They don't have to pay, and there is no disincentive to go, so there's overutilization. 
There are costs to all of these things. There are other ways of doing it, and I would have suggested we go in the opposite direction. All of that being said, if I were to choose tomorrow, I would, would not have chosen another course. In fact, I miss practicing medicine. I still try to do it every couple of months to, to stay in practice in case y'all get unhappy with me and decide to send me back to being a physician. Um, but uh, for the young people, I would say don't worry so much. I mean, try to participate. Be active politically. Try to make it a better uh, situation for when you come out. But I wouldn't say I, I, I wouldn't say look at it and say, oh, it's just going to be terrible and rotten. It is going to be different than it was even for me and for the people 10 years older. There's going to be less private practice. It's less likely you can be on your own. But there still are group practices. There still are people, even who work for the hospital, who have their own practices and are able to have private practice. So I think there is still some future. There's some innovative solutions beyond this, talking about people who actually now just do cash. There are family doctors in Tennessee. There's one who just has their own clinic actually charge less than some of the insurance do. They charge like $39 or something to come in. It's like an urgent care, but they're just a business person. They don't bill any insurance. And uh, those were other alternatives that could have come about and were coming about, but have been somewhat stifled. There's a lot unknown from what will happen with Obamacare. We will see, but I think my concern is it's going to be more expensive insurance. Part-time workers working 34, 36 hours a week may go to a 29 because their employers don't have to give them insurance at 29. So people you're trying to help you may actually hurt. Somebody making $30,000, $40,000 a year can't afford $15,000 worth of insurance. So if you say it has to cover everything from, um, you know, pregnancy to sex change to lap band surgery, if your insurance is going to cover all that stuff, it's going to be very expensive. And... I think that prices people out of the market at the lower end, too. So I worry about the repercussions. I don't know if the fight's completely over. I will continue to fight to make it less bad at the very least, and at the best, if we ever took over, I'd try to get rid of the whole thing and go more towards the marketplace. But uh, I want to thank you guys. Thank you, Matt, for inviting me, and uh, I've enjoyed being back at a medical school. Hopefully I will not get any tests or anything today. <laughs> thank you very much. And I'll be happy to do a few questions. Those are easy questions. <laughs> and no basic science questions. It's been a long time <laughs> since I've had to do any basic science questions. This question is from a faculty member named Chris. He asks, uh, what is your opinion on who should fund residency training? We currently graduate more students than available residency positions. Somebody might have to help me exactly how we fund it now. I mean, I know residents bill for procedures and hospitals bill for things that residents do, as well as for the faculty. Um, some of that probably, I would guess some of the training comes, somebody in administration help me with it. Some of it comes from, uh, from, from what you bill and what you bring in. Medicare. And Medicare. From Medicare. Yeah, but is there a specific allotment to each school of a certain X dollars based on how many residency positions? Like if a resident makes $25,000, how much of it is coming from what comes in that you bill and how much of it's coming from another fund? Can anybody help me? Right here first. Well, except for if I put a chest, if I if I put a chest tube in, you bill for that under the, under the faculty member's name, right? Right. But the faculty members don't get everything they bill for either. Some of that goes to the overhead of the hospital, right? So some of it. It's, it's a complicated song and dance because if you're an existing ophthalmologist, you're like, do we really want to have 20 ophthalmologists graduate from the U of L? So existing physicians aren't happy about more positions. There's the cost to it as well. And the other thing about it is, is in a marketplace, 
if you got more physicians, if you had 10 people making bread and then you had 20 people making bread, the cost of bread would go down. In healthcare, all the prices are fixed. So the government actually see this is why it's bad to have government charge everything. The government sees more doctors as a liability. They see more hospitals as a liability. Why do we limit how many hospitals are going to be built and how many doctors we can have? Because healthcare, we spend more. The more of you out there practicing, the more the taxpayer will spend. So there's all these countervailing back and forth. And in most professions, it wouldn't be a central authority deciding it. That's part of the problem because when a, when a central authority or a politician decides how many slots there should be, you got all these people lobbying from both sides of the equation. I don't know what the right answer is. I don't. It's hard for me to tell you how many internal medicine doctors we should have, how many family practice doctors we should have, how many. It's hard to tell that. You hear people saying we're getting, we're headed towards shortages. We may well be because we're getting more people retired. You would think we would be headed in that direction, but they have to be matched. How many people come into medical school with this? I don't know that I have an easy answer. Uh, really for it other than to say that it, um, it is different than most parts of the marketplace because most parts it would balance. And it, it does a little bit, but it, it doesn't exactly. So in most places, if you got twice as many ophthalmologists, the price would cut in half. But government pays the same price no matter whether it's 2,000 ophthalmologists or 10,000 ophthalmologists. Okay, uh, this question comes from Mark, who's a medical student, and it's along the same lines with do you think the current trends regarding hospital mergers in the country jeopardize the positive influence of free market forces in making uh, the availability of quality care? Well, definitely your independence is lost, you know, and a lot of people like the idea of being a physician and being in charge of your own practice or with a group of people being in charge of your own practice. Um, I think the trend continues, although I can tell you in my career of about 20 years, I saw three different waves of practices bought and then disgorged is the best way to put it. I saw private entities buy ophthalmology practices in the 90s thinking, oh, we're going to make more money out of them. By the physicians are dumb. They can't run their business. We're going to make them more efficient. And then they had them, and then they discovered when they put the physicians on salaries, the physicians also didn't work as hard either. So they got rid of the physicians. They bought them, then they sold them. Then hospitals in Nashville bought like 300 practices in my area again like in the early 2000s, then they sold them too. It didn't work. But now it's happened again, and I get the feeling, and I'm more than happy to hear other people's opinion, but I get the feeling the wave is such this time and the paperwork's so onerous, and if you have to do all this, you know, pay for quality nonsense, which to me is more paperwork, and nobody's going to get better quality, but someone will figure out how to fill out the paperwork to get more money for pay for quality. And that's really what's happening. Now, everybody's scrambling to learn how to, how can we fill out more paperwork? It's like electronic medical records. I love them, electronic medical records, but it slows you down. It costs you somebody to fill them out, to, to do them, or you've got to turn away from the patient and do them. And now the government's complaining because people are billing more. Why did they sell us electronic medical records? They said, oh, you can bill more because you can put more stuff in your note. Now you get notes from a referring physician. It's got 15 pages, and you have no idea what's real, what's not real. It's like, does he have an appendicitis or doesn't he? And uh, the notes aren't very believable, I think, anymore because everything under the sun is on the note. And I really – I would much rather see uh, – you know, a handwritten note or a one-minute conversation. I, in fact, you now almost have to have the conversation with a referring physician to know what the hell is note, what, what the hell he's really trying to tell you in the note. So, but we bill more because of it too, and people are doing it because you're billing based on having X, Y, and Z listed on the note. Um, but I don't, I don't think we get our any healthier. Got another example of it under uh, Obamacare and the current ev evolution of things. We had 18,000 diagnostic codes. We're going to 144,000 diagnostic codes. It's like you're going to be a lot healthier now because there's more diagnostic codes. There's going to be 312 new codes for injuries sustained by animals. 72 new codes for injuries sustained by birds. Nine new codes for injuries sustained by the bird, the macaw. Anybody ever seen a macaw injury? There's two new codes for injuries sustained by turtles. One, whether you've been struck or bitten by a turtle. There's a new code for injuries sustained from burning water skis. I grew up water skiing. I never saw anybody get an injury from water, burning water skis. There's an injury from walking into a lamppost. There's another code for walking into a lamppost subsequent encounter. So, I mean... But that's, you have people who think somehow we're going to be healthier pushing more paper around with more diagnostic codes. But 
somebody's going to make a mint off all the new software they're going to sell the hospital and all these practices on on all the new software to change all the codes and someone will pull their hair out filling out all the the codes this question is from Karen uh, she's a staff member here and says I am a middle class hourly worker who pays hundreds of dollars monthly for health insurance that I can't afford due to a three thousand dollar deductible can you give me hope but you would hope if you had that high of a deductible you'd actually have lower premiums and that sort of should be the goal but uh, we don't have a true marketplace the way the way you have lower costs in medicine lower and less expensive insurance and less expensive costs for things is you have to have competition and that means price competition we have almost no price competition in fact it was illegal in much of the country for much of our history to list your prices and because it's so complicated if I don't have insurance and I call U of L's hospital I'm guessing it's complicated if I call up and say how much will you charge me for a colonoscopy why because like cataract surgery my office we charged eighteen hundred dollars why because we didn't want to miss any insurance company that might actually pay fifteen hundred dollars and Medicare still paid seven hundred dollars but all the charges are fictitious so you, you when you get into practice in your first month you'll say I just billed a hundred thousand dollars last month means nothing because you're going to collect about half of that or less you know and then you pay everybody but the thing is is the charges mean nothing but it makes it complicated for people trying to figure out who don't have insurance or high deductibles what the charge is and then the hospitals are hesitant to, to let the price come down because they're afraid they might lose out on some insurer that might pay more the insurers don't want to tell you what they will pay so it's a really backward system but you have no price competition and uh, that's the only way you make prices lower is to somehow bring in uh, competition in. Uh, this question comes from a med student named Andrew, and his question is: Do you believe healthcare and health is a commodity, and if not, should we guarantee? How should we guarantee coverage and health? Uh, there's a philosophic debate which often gets me in trouble, you know, on whether health codes are right or not. I think we as physicians have an obligation as Christians we have an obligation to our fellow man and I really believe that and it's a deep held belief but I don't think you have a right to my labor you don't have a right to anybody else's labor I mean food's pretty important do you have a right to the labor of the farmer do you have a right to food do you have a right to water well, as humans yeah we do have an obligation to give people water to give people food to, to give people health care but it's, it's not a right because once you conscript people and say oh it's a right then you really you're in charge it's servitude you're in charge of me and I'm supposed to do whatever you tell me to do and it really shouldn't be seen that way even things that are very important are things that uh, you have to get from other individuals you don't have the right to mandate your behavior or anybody else's behavior with regard to even things important like health care doesn't mean though that we don't have an obligation so I think it's a difference between calling something an obligation and calling something a right maybe one or two more um, this question is from Charlie, and it says, what is your opinion regarding H.R. 3000 uh, introduced by Representative Price as an alternative to the ACA? You have to tell me, who, who introduced it, Price? Um, I'll have to ask my staff because she used to work for Price. I'm not sure exactly what's in the, in the bill. Um, I am in favor of any of the solutions that expand health savings accounts, that e expand uh, the ability to develop a marketplace. Um, and I think that's the direction we should have gone for more for more coverage. We do two more. Uh, this comes from a medical student, and it's with uh, SGR Medica mandated Medicare and Medicaid cutting reimbursements to doctors. How do we see this impacting a patient's choice of physicians and quality of care? And if this is an issue, what is your solution? Yeah. The SGR is the sustained growth rate, and it means that if inflation went up. In healthcare, 9%. We're going to cut doctors and hospitals by 9%. That's a, that's not exactly the way it works, but that's just kind of how it works. We've had it since like 1997. I think they let it go into effect one year, and every year since then, everybody lives all year long with the threat of it happening, and it's actually cumulative. It's now up to over 30% in cuts if it ever is maintained. Every year we've we've uh, avoided this law or voided it temporarily for one year. To me, it's like if every year we're going to temporarily repeal it, it sounds like it's bad policy. 
for like 14 years, we've been repealing bad policy, but we never do it permanently. So then physicians and hospitals have to live with the uncertainty of what they're going to be paid for a whole year. At the end of the year in a scramble, it gets delayed for another year. It's stupid. It's bad policy and ought to be repealed. One of the reasons it's not is everything in Congress is weighed with a cost. It's money that's expended by the federal government when Medicare pays hospitals and doctors. So there's a cost to not reducing fees. And so they say, oh, that cost has to come from somewhere else. Well, since we've repealed it every year, I tell them it's a fiction that it's ever going to happen. So it's fictionary costs. Why don't we just do it? Just pass a bill and get rid of the policy and then figure out other ways, really, where everybody in society bears the burden of how we pay for our health care, not saying it's somehow the responsibility of physicians and hospitals to reduce what they're paid because it's their fault that health care costs are going up. So uh, I do have a repair bill for SGR, a permanent repeal, and I do support a permanent repeal of that. Why don't we try uh, one more? Um, uh, Senator Paul, a majority of the med students here today have uh, a comprehensive exam tomorrow. Um, <laughs> just wonder if you have any last-minute advice. <laughs> Actually, I do. Um, I'll tell you, uh, this: I never, ever cheated, and I don't condone cheating, but I would sometimes spread misinformation. <laughs> so, and this is a great tactic. Misinformation can be very important. So one time, we're in the library, and we're studying for a path test, and so we just started spreading the rumor that we knew what was on the test, and it was definitely all about liver. Everything, there's going to be a vast majority of questions all about liver. So we tried to trick all of our competing students into overstudying for the liver and not studying for the kidney and every other organ that's on there. But uh, so that's my advice. Misinformation works. Uh, so try to try to trick your opponents into knowing that the test is about something it's not. But uh, no, I uh, I think uh, I, I have fond memories of uh, all my training, and I think one of the great things about continue, one that you continue to learn the surgeries I did this week. We're using a new laser, which is really cool. When a cataract's white, it's hard to see the capsule. When you're in there, if you don't have a red reflex where the light is shining back through the lens, you can't see the capsule. When you start to tear it, you have no idea where you are. Plus, it's milky, and all this it's sort of a milky cloud comes out when you open the capsule. And they have a new laser, and this is another problem with healthcare. The new laser is really cool. It'll actually make a circular opening with the laser. It actually will make incisions in the cornea, so when you go in, the hardest part of the surgery is already done. You have a perfect circle already cut. Problem is, the laser costs about a half a million. Medicare won't let you charge for it. It's not covered under any procedure. It does make cataract surgery safer. If you've got a rock-hard, light-perception cataract, the chances that the surgeon could uh, make an error in trying to remove it are probably 5%, whereas a normal cataract might be 1 in 500 you know, this is a hard cataract remove, but there's no reimbursement for the laser. In fact, it's tricky even getting to where you can get the customer to pay for it beyond that. But uh, lots of obstacles, but the bottom line is I would like to leave you with the message that um, everything about being a physician is really above and beyond and, and such a great profession that no matter how bad the government makes it, which they are making it worse, it's still a great pr profession. Good luck. One, la one last thing. Senator Paul, to thank you for coming to speak to us today. We have this little token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, everybody, who helped to organize this. We appreciate all of your help. It means a lot. Thank you for making this a successful event. Good luck tomorrow.